Hello, my name's Helen Ennis, and I'm here today with the architectural photographer John Gollings, who's known not only in Australia, but around the world as uh, one of our most outstanding architectural photographers. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to ask him some questions about his career, but also about his views on architectural photography more generally. So John has had uh, a career that spans nearly five decades, in fact. Uh, he's been working in this area since the early to mid 1970s. His uh, clients, if you look at who he's worked for, it's like a who's who of Australian architecture. And he's someone who has innovated in all sorts of interesting ways, introducing color, um, making aerial photography uh, as part of his practice and introducing manipulation from a very uh, early phase when a lot of people were still working in fact with straight black and white photography. So it's my absolute pleasure to be here and to be able to talk to John about his architectural photography and the work that he's done in Australia in particular. Thank you for that introduction Helen, that was great. Now, how did you come to architectural photography, given you already had uh, a practice in other kinds of photography? I had studied architecture at Melbourne University and a friend asked me at the end of my course to fill in in a, a fashion studio um, to uh, work with an assistant that I'd brought out from London. And I had always been taking photographs and, and loved it. And so I deferred my final year of architecture and uh, fell into some very big national advertising and fashion accounts, which I pursued probably for the next 10 or 15 years. And um, at, at the end of that, uh, there was one of those um, recessions and the fashion industry in Australia went into uh, decline. And I realized that no one wants an old fashioned photograph, but if mm -hmm. I swapped to photographing buildings, which I still loved, um, mm -hmm. I was building up a valuable national archive and um, so I decided to dedicate myself uh, full time to just photographing architecture. And I think it's so interesting that you did study architecture before you became an architectural photographer. And so do you think that was important for you? Did it, that already uh, make you look at architectural photography with a critical eye? Uh, yes, it, look, it, it taught me primarily about proportion uh, and composition and that became a hallmark in my own work. I, I have what I call a, a, a dumb philosophy about composition where I put things in the middle of the picture and I put horizons in the middle but that all came out from Corb's book La Modulor and, uh, and I'd always done mathematics at school and I was intrigued by uh, proportional systems and golden mm. means and that apart from the knowledge of architecture, um, it, it really did inform my photography. Hmm. Now, I would love to know more about your approach. So say uh, an architect rings you, wants to commission you to take some photographs of a building that they've recently completed. How yes. do you think go about it? What Talk us through what happens. Uh, I like to have a, an intensive conversation with the architect. It, it's often done by email. Um, but if it's in Melbourne, I'll go into their office. I'm interested in their design philosophy and what they've been trying to express through the building because that directly informs the approach I take because I don't just take a regular photograph. Um, I'd say my pictures are either interpretive or expressive and they're trying to build on my understanding of what the architect is getting at. So then I want to know the orientation and from that, I can work out the time of day and where I should be. And, and I, using my knowledge of where the sun is going to be, I decide to either work with the sun or against the sun. And I tend to prefer backlight as distinct from other photographers. And I generally don't like blue sky and green grass. So I work against the light and get a white sky. And um, I take it from there. Beyond that, I'm somewhat somewhat speedy, too speedy sometimes, and quite quick. I, I just rock up to the building. I can very quickly sense the composition that I want, and I just start shooting and work my way through. Generally takes all day and all night to cover, say, a house, and a couple of days to do a bigger building. And would you sometimes go to a site with the architect, or, you, or do you prefer to be on your own when you're thinking uh, about how I, you're going to photograph it? 
I have no preference to be on my own and I generally work with an assistant. Um, uh, but I, equally, I'm very happy to have the architect there, especially if I can turn around and say, do you like this or don't like it or look through the back of the camera. And those architects um, that are particularly fussy, I, I do request that they actually come because otherwise I could go off on a tangent. So it's really handy sometimes to get their point of view and also to understand the style of photography that they like. Um, and if I'm sensing that my compositions are not what they want, I'll do both. And I've also uh, read some of your statements where you explain too that you do a lot of pre-visualization. So you're able to think in advance about the kind of uh, picture you would like to make. So yeah. could you talk about what's involved in that where you're getting an image in your head before you, you've even uh, decided actually about how you're going to work <laughs> in the field? I, I either get it from my reading of the plans, which the architect might have sent to me, but it's generally a, a more creative approach and it, it's often I'll lie awake at night in bed having seen some preliminary shots that the architect might have sent me trying to work out precisely how I'm going to do it and what the look of the photograph will be and I learned that from Ansel Adams when I worked with him um, all his landscape work was pre-visualized at the moment he pressed the button he knew exactly what detail was going to be on his negative and he knew exactly how he was going to print it and I'm doing the same I'm working up the color schemes I'm working at the composition um, and I'm working up the exposure and I do pretty much work to what I intended to get in that image yeah so it's quite a conceptual process too isn't it as well as um, something that Very has all those practicalities involved like what the weather is doing what the the yeah. uh, Light is doing and so on. And of course, if you're traveling overseas and you've only got one or two days, you have to live with the weather. That, that's the weather is my mm. uh, beat noir. Um, but I've now got techniques to overcome even the worst sort of weather. If, if, if there's no good daylight, then I work at night and um, work at dusk. Uh, yes. And if there's a lot, if there's too much sunshine, I work against the sun. Um, I, I, a lot of my work is contradictory. Um, which I, I guess is, is um, uh, it contributes to my look over a period of time. And dusk, I understand, is a particular time of day. You're particularly fond of dusk. Uh, and and, yeah. and uh, why, why is that? Well, it, dusk is what I call a very efficient photograph um, because you can generally look inside the building and the outside and the composition changes dramatically because the light coming from inside the building alters the volumetric experience. So in one image, you can see more of the building, but you also get a quite dramatic and memorable image as well. And um, it's, uh, it is that efficiency aspect. My philosophy is to take the least number of photographs of a building as possible. And that's very different to others who are trying to take hundreds of pictures. I try to get a lot of architectural information into one image and in the ideal world I get one hero exterior and one hero interior and that's the end of the job. Now what what is a hero image too? How do you know you've got the hero image? What, what are you looking for in something? It's a very subtle combination of a strong composition, uh, a, a good description of the architectural features and elements uh, and something that's memorable. And that memorability is what enables the architect to publish that one definitive picture for the rest of that building's life. And, you know, there are, there are famous architectural shots because they most quickly describe the building mm -hmm. and have a very strong composition. And it's composition, I believe, adds credibility to the image. You, you don't want a viewer to think that it was a rushed snapshot. So the precision of my composition is what justifies the contents to the viewer. And do you know when you've got that hero shot? Is it something almost instinctive that you think, aha, that's it? Pretty much, yes, yes. Sometimes you work all day and you're getting a bit desperate and then come twilight and suddenly the lights will come on and you'll shift your point of view and get the shot. And I, I guess I keep working until I think that I do have that definitive exterior and definitive interior 
And sometimes the interiors are harder because you have to make a decision about which room or which um, ambient entry space uh, is going to represent the interior. And John, I know that uh, in your view, there's three main uh, approaches to architectural <laughs> photography and you've developed a really clear sense of where you sit in that. So would you like to uh, just comment on, on those three and then tell us more about what expressionistic architectural photography is all about? Yes, there's um, uh, architectural photography uh, goes through cycles of fashionability and um, the, the, the current fashion uh, comes from uh, younger photographers working for magazines principally and they're taking what I would call decorative photographs which are photographs that are very pretty brilliant compositions that actually show nothing it'll be the corner of a bench and it'll be a picture on a wall and it, it may have a prop um, they do everything except actually show the architecture um, they might be good for uh, selling contents um, anyway it, it's the the decorator look the next one is the average pragmatic I, I wrote some I'd say respectful and conservative photography the lens angles are not too wide the time of day is correct for the light across the building and showing the shadows um, they do a perfectly adequate job but they're not really saying anything either about the photography or the building they're just recording it and I think you need to do more so in the third category in which I'd put my work is a um, an interpretive and expressionistic photograph which is not necessarily totally honest to the building but is very honest to the architect's design intent and is going to it's going to do two things it's going to put my architect clients on the map commercially because the buildings are going to win awards using strong photographs he's going to get better publication um, they're doing a whole lot of pragmatic things for the architect but primarily i'm trying to give a, a really adequate description of the architecture and its intent and um, that that's there's the three forms so there's the the pretty picture the regular picture and the excessive picture i guess you could say and uh, what do you bring to bear then? Like, what's your vocabulary that enables you to achieve an expressionistic look? Um, the the first thing I'd say is I'm a, something of a wide angle queen. <clears throat> um, I'll say that again. I'm, I'm something <laughs> of a wide angle queen. I've, I've got some of the, um, the widest lenses uh, known to man. And um, the first thing I'm trying to do is place my client's building within context so that wide angle i'll stand in front of the building but the wide angle will show me the surroundings and i think that's important for the viewer to understand how sensitively the building has been sighted and then i might be looking for a distinctive approach to the light and in my case i generally work against the light the reason there is that i can expose for into the shadows and get more detail and i get a white sky um, because I don't like the, the domination of a blue sky. Um, and then I might be looking for some symbols or props. And then I'll also be looking for the interaction of people moving through the building. And I do that. I generally have them walking away from the camera because I don't want them to become a portrait. And I blur them. But I, they're there for scale and activity and interest. And I do that with multiple exposures. So I choose the people and where they go and the clothing they're wearing. So there's a lot of post-production in all my shots. Mm. And colour is so important too, isn't it? Your, uh, the, the, the love you have of colour and, and your photographs, they have a very rich uh, colour. Yes, they do. I, I mean, I, I suppose I'm dodging and burning so I get a, a, a moody quality, a, a sort of almost a Rembrandt quality. Um, I'm also trying to be sensitive to the actual, the true colours, but you can, uh, where other photographers are, are deliberately washing stuff out as a style, I'm trying to be true or even moodier um, to get to, to just add to that memorability. Um, and colour, I mean, colour's a new phenomenon. When I mm. entered the business, it was all black and white. Um, and guys like Max Dupain were actually uncomfortable shooting colour because they didn't have exposure meters. They, they felt the sun on the back of their neck and they knew what mm. aperture to set. Uh, colour requires a bit of accuracy. So um, 
I, I suppose, famously came to be regarded as the, the photographer that broke that black and white barrier with um, what Elizabeth Farrell used to call lurid purple skies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, to talk about context a bit more, because that to me seems so crucial that when you photograph a building, we also see the things that are off to the side of the building or in front of the building and so on. So we get a sense of how people might inhabit not just that building, but the space, the, the, the whole, whole space um, that extends beyond the architect's own vision. So how important do you think that context is? Well, it's incredibly important, and I, I can segue for a little bit. I Halfway through my earlier career, I started getting a lot of work in helicopters to photograph not just a building, but a whole city. People would ask me to find the definitive aerial picture of the city. And from that, I came to understand that the totality of the context and the composition of the city and the landscape itself was important. And then you, so you start with that very wide shot from the air, and now I'm using drones as well. And then you narrow it down to your building, but you do need to see the context. You need to see whether the architect is working in, in opposition to the surrounding buildings or whether he's trying to blend in and, and be sensitive to the, the existing fabric. Um, so, there's some of the reasons why context in a photograph is very important for the viewer to understand the success or otherwise of, of the architecture. And of course, sometimes like the Sydney Opera House, you pointedly wanted to stand out and, and become a, a major element. Um, but other more sensitive restoration projects and industrial areas, uh, you probably want to get that even Parisian grain. So all these things are running through your head when you deciding how to photograph a building. I'm it's interested in just the, the practicalities of going up in a helicopter. So, for example, when you photographed uh, Parliament House in Canberra, yep. are, you, are you hanging out the door of the helicopter or, or where are you <laughs> no, sitting I'm, in it to be able to take your photographs? I've got the door off and my feet are on the skids and I'm held in. Um, I have really? one. I once did actually fall out of a helicopter uh, and was pulled oh. in. It was very scary. It's uh, when I was doing nighttime shots over Sydney and um, the ABC helicopter pilot just tipped out and I was on the photographer's plywood floor and I just literally slid out. Um, and, 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 and how far? <laughs> I, I, that was pretty scary. Yeah. Um, but Were yeah, you injured? No, no. I, I was on a very strong harness and, and I had an assistant in the helicopter who put, and I, my feet got tangled up in the skids. Oh, and my they, goodness. They pulled me back in. Um, I've not forgotten that one, um, but no, you're you are hanging out, and um, you yes, you you need a good you need a pilot who understands roughly the sort of photograph you're taking. And I flew with one uh, good friend, John Acott, for twenty years, and he was a photographer himself, and he would it was terrific because he would put me almost exactly where we want to take the photograph. He knew about axiality, he knew about angles, he knew about look down shots. And um, we work very efficiently together because you, it's very noisy and it's uncomfortable and you're shouting with headphones. Uh, it's, mm. it's not a good way to take photographs. So you, you need to pretty much know what you're aiming for before you take yes. off. Yeah. And uh, would you say that your sense of humour or when you introduce elements of humour into a photograph, that that's part of your expressionistic approach? Yeah, yes, it is. And it, it dates back to um, the early 70s. I was at a party in Sydney with Harry Seidler and I got into a conversation and I said to Harry that I, I thought there was a lot of humour in architecture anyway. Um, and, and he turned and screamed at me and said, there's no such thing as humour in architecture. And I, I think ever after that, I made sure I found something funny in most of the shots I took just to get, um, get back at Harry Seidler. Uh, he was very serious about um, design and, and meaning. Mm. And of course, I was in the full flush of postmodernism in those days and thought that humour was an essential element. Mm. I've probably got a bit more like Harry in my older years. And this, uh, in a way, you've defined Australian architectural photography in, in recent decades with your uh, focus on colour and uh, this expressionistic approach that we've been talking about. But do you think there is a particular strength in Australian architectural photography? Like, do we do things here that are different to other places? 
Well, I, I certainly think we're up with the best in the world. Um, and I think it's being slightly smaller population and a very competitive environment. Uh, I do think the competition amongst the, you know, say the top 10 or so photographers in this country is making all of us um, work very hard to both uh, to cover the buildings and, and to produce a body of work that matches the quality of the architecture. And Australian architects are certainly amongst the best in the world. We're, we're doing the best work in China, um, in fact, right through Southeast Asia. Uh, I think, um, yes, I, I think we're, we're all contributing and marching in lockstep with the architecture profession itself. Um, the educational system here is good. Um, and there's, yes, the competition just keeps everyone on their toes. Now, you've just mentioned Australian architecture, and I think a lot of us will be aware that we are world leading in so many respects. But as a photographer, what say you got a commission to photograph a building that you felt was unsuccessful? How do you <laughs> deal with that? <laughs> Depends so, no, on I don't you. want to photograph it, which Wolfgang Sieve has famously said about Parliament House, or do you right. uh, try and uh, bring you know, your own interpretation to bear? Um, it, it does happen. It happened last year. I asked to photograph a, a suite of buildings in Melbourne that I really didn't think worked particularly well on the horizon. Um, and I did it because I took it as a challenge to see if I could make something of it. Um, but there are other buildings where I've just politely said I'm, I'm too busy because I, mm -hmm. I don't think they're good. Um, but that I'm, I'm not against... Um, unconventional work. Um, and there are some architects whose style is, is not my cup of tea, but I understand they're very serious about it and it's worth exploring and documenting. Um, so yes, you just have to make your mind up. Um, but generally like a doctor in his surgery, you, you can't really um, pick and choose your clients. I mean, you, you cope with what you, you're given. And um, it's, uh, and, and equally, I tend to only be given better jobs these days. The younger photographers get the, the, the dodgier jobs. Yes, the more difficult. They have to their stripes on it. Now, you're known as an innovator, not just for your aerial photography and the use of colour, but also for all these uh, really uh, amazing technical things that you do. So would you like to um, just talk now about the use of, of, of digital technologies and what you see as the emergent technologies like drone photography and so on. Yes, it's, um, I, I guess it started with the switch to digital uh, because that brought basically Photoshop into play where you, the photographer had much more control over the imagery. And it was at that point that the, the finished product from all of us photographers is a much higher level than it was on, on film where you couldn't dodge and burn and take things out. I, I can quite happily remove a, a, a pipe poking out of a roof if it's not part of the architecture. So it started with Photoshop and digital photography. Now it's moved into a whole lot of um, uh, additional modes of description like virtual reality, um, rendered architectural photographs that don't actually exist in reality but are coming through I mean, in particular in my studio, I actually have renderers working for me um, and, and I shoot the background and we drop in a, a, a totally virtual building and it's, it's indistinguishable from real. Wow. Um, now I'm working in 3D um, and I'm doing a lot of walkthroughs. There's imagery on the screen where the viewer can walk himself through the building from a, 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 a 3D picture that I've taken. Um, and so that it's no longer is the photographer choosing the viewpoint, you're taking a, a, a virtual um, description in, in three dimensions that the viewer can walk themselves through and choose to look up or look down or look around and make their own composition. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, in the architectural studios, they've got 3D printers now. So the building is visualized long before it's ever built. And mm -hmm. the other one I should mention is the move to video. To, to the moving image. I've, I'm still learning how to take a still photograph, but the younger photographers that want to know what direction should they take, my first advice is get into moving images. And of course you can now 
take a moving image of a perspective corrected picture, which you could never do in the past. So all mm -hmm. these things are rapidly uh, adding to the um, the vocabulary, I, I guess, of, of, of work that different photographers can do. And a, a lot are now only doing um, animations and moving images because social media can so easily put a, a little clip of moving image of a building on. Mm. So I, I think uh, social media would be the other final thing I've mentioned that has fundamentally changed the way we work. We don't need big files. We just need little ones. A lot of clients are just shooting on their iPhone. Um, and in fact, and then asking the photographer to copy their iPhone shots. And we know that that's a 35 millimeter angle of view. So um, it's, uh, so there's now an iPhone look that we have to cope with. Yeah. I think that's um, fascinating because it really is pointing to quite a different future. What you've shown us is that the architectural photography has been evolving endlessly and it's going off now in really interesting that's highly, right. yes. but also highly technically accomplished um, directions. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's fascinating. And I've, I've sort of luckily been on that um, cusp of a lot of new and emerging technologies. And I've always been interested in keeping up with it. So it, it's kept me um, working hard and thinking hard. It's, it's, been, it's been a very interesting, fascinating career, I must say. Thanks so much, John. It's been fascinating to uh, hear about what you've been doing in architectural photography, but also what you see as the future, because it's an area that's obviously evolving so quickly now, and uh, it'll be fascinating to see what comes to pass in the next few years. Thanks again, John. Thank you for your great questions. <laughs>